from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Could a new guest worker program find its way through Congress? Plus, milk production jumping during the August cooldown and agribusiness preparing to trade 2018. Personally, I think the government is still probably a little bit too high on their yield estimate. Uh, but time will tell. No, time won't, time won't tell. That, that, that digital read on that combine will tell. <laughs> Feed yards stay in the black one more week. And stories from Harvey as cleanup continues in the Lone Star State. Ag Day. Presented by the Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths with a big agenda and the weeks flying by. The focus on reforms out of Washington seems to be gaining velocity. From hurricanes to health care and tax reform, the list is long. Well, now a fresh push for bipartisan immigration reform. During a speech at the United Fresh Produce Washington Conference, Arizona Senator Jeff Flake spoke about the issue and says hardworking migrants need to be accounted for in immigration policy, including reforms to the H-2A guest worker program. According to the numbers from the Department of Labor, American farmers are turning more often to that program to help fill their needs. So far in 2017, the department has issued 160,000 visas. That's up 20% compared to the same time last year. Georgia leads all other states with nearly 19,000 visas. California coming in at 12,000. But farmers and ag businesses complain the current H-2A program is cumbersome, slow, and doesn't work in many livestock scenarios where labor is needed year round. U.S. Representative Bob Goodlon of Virginia is planning to introduce the Agricultural Guest Worker Act next week. It would replace the current H-2A program during that same United Fresh Conference. Goodlon says the act reduces red tape, including greater access to guest workers without a pathway to citizenship, offering higher wages, 15% above a state's minimum wage. It has no requirement for worker housing and transportation and allows currently illegal farm workers to participate in the program. He's hoping to introduce it in the committee next week and start a markup shortly after. The H2C program, as he's calling it, would be run out of USDA. Meanwhile, negotiations between the three countries and the North American Free Trade Agreement are set to restart this weekend in Canada. The U.S. Trade Representative's Office, Robert Lighthizer, saying this week that negotiations on the trade agreement are moving at, quote, warp speed, but it may lead to no agreement. Lighthizer saying we don't know whether we're going to get to a conclusion. That's the problem. We're running very quickly somewhere. In Idaho, representatives from the governor's office, the Idaho wheat industry and Taiwan flour mills agreeing to sign a $576 million deal. The agreement covering the next two years and helping secure wheat exports to Taiwan, now the seventh largest overseas market for U.S. ag exports. August was cool in the Midwest and that made it a good month for producing milk. Production per cow averaging nearly 1,950 pounds in August. That's the highest production per cow for that month since the number started being collected. This comes from the latest milk production report from NAS. Overall, in the 23 biggest producing states, milkers pumping 17 billion pounds. That's up 2% from last year. The size of the nation's cow herd steady from July to August, but it's still about 66,000 head higher than a year ago. California continuing to lead in total production but was just one of four states with lower production compared to a year ago. Utah seeing the biggest year-over-year -year increase in August. It was up 10%. Speaking of California, a new lawsuit asked the question, can county government force you to keep farming in order to keep your land? The Pacific Legal Foundation stepping in to defend Willie Benedetti, owner of Benedetti Farms and Willie Bird Turkeys. He wants to build a house on his land for his son, but Marin County's new land use plan requires landowners who currently use their land for agricultural purposes to remain, quote, actively and directly engaged in agriculture in perpetuity. For Willie, that would mean he must choose between working forever or retiring and giving up his property. Benedetti is suing the county and the California Coastal Commission for what he claims is unconstitutional condition on his right to use his property. If you seek a permit to build a dwelling in the agricultural zone, the county wants you to promise that the landowner will remain actively and directly engaged in agriculture. And what this is doing is using people's property to place a restriction on the landowner, forcing them to do a particular career and essentially giving them a choice, either remain engaged in agriculture forever or get rid of the property. Government 
control in my life. I just want to build a house for my son. You know, I don't, it's, it's, uh, we're not talking about environmental issues. We're, we're just talking about building a house. And then, and, and I have to stay in agriculture to see that it get done. Otherwise, he can't build it. Litigation is ongoing in the Marin County Superior Court. With a look around the country in today's crop conditions, we have Mike Hoffman in today's crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning to you, Clinton. Crop comments start today in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where Betsy Gibbon is visiting Keenert Dairy Farm. The family runs a fall festival each year. The theme this year is Star Wars. Sarah Kuhnert is a dietitian and a dairy farmer, so she likes to talk about the importance of milk in your diet to the families who visit the farm. The family says silage chopping is about three weeks behind, though, this year. And taking a look at the weather map, you can see, uh, well, we still have a tropical storm off the northeast coast. Other than that, there's a lot of heat across the middle of the country. We'll have your forecast coming up, but first, here are some hometown temps. This is Machinery Pete, inviting you to check out my new website, MachineryPete.com, offering farmers tens of thousands of used equipment listings to search. Let Machinery Pete help you find and value your next piece of used equipment. Up next, Jim Bauer joins us to look at opening the book on 2018 marketing, and later meet a Texas farmer who lost his crop but fought back against Harvey to keep his home. Unlock the power of ag technology this December in Indianapolis at the first ever Ag Tech Expo. Learn all about it at farmjournalagtech.com. Here at the Agribusiness Desk, I have Jim Bauer, Bauer Trading. Uh, Jim, let's talk about some of the strategies that maybe we can use in this corn market to help us I don't know, maybe make a little money in uh, 2017, 2018, if possible? Well, hopefully, hopefully things will get better as we go into 2018. You know, we're down to price levels now from a cash standpoint in parts of this country where you, you simply can't make any money. Mm. There, there, there's no return there. So the low prices cure low prices. I and I think there's some things happening internationally from a demand standpoint, particularly the situation with ethanol in China, mm -hmm. expanding their ethanol production uh, on a major way. But again, I think the market's got to get through harvest. We've got to see just exactly what the yields truly are, mm -hmm. not what the estimates. Right. Estimates are only so good for so long. Sooner or later, the market has to come to the attention, and maybe the crop is better than we think. Sure. But I have a suspicion because of the dryness and the pockets of dryness and heat that we saw in parts of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio during the course of summer. Personally, I think the government is still probably a little bit too high on their yield estimate. Uh, but time will tell. No, time won't, time won't tell. That, that, that digital read on that combine will tell. <laughs> the yield monitor will tell. As far us. as strategy, I like sell and defend. Sell the cash, defend it with some type of strategy that fits their risk parameters. Uh, and as, of course, I've always been pro grain bins and, and, and pro tracking the basis. So you can put that in your farm office and check that every day because that can be an opportunity for each individual customer sure. based upon their locality. Yeah, and you know, as we get into 2018, how far out are you going? Are you willing to look at this point? Well, a lot has to do with what these yields actually are. And mm -hmm. I can be off on that, I can be, I can be dead wrong on that, but it just seems to me that once we get this harvest underway, and, and if, as long as we're not above where we currently are as far as what the previous crop report said, I think that by, by January, things will find better footing. I, okay. Right now, I think the bin doors are gonna be slammed shut once this harvest is in, and they're gonna wait to see if they can get better prices in 2018, which I think we will, but you've gotta be patient. Another way they can play that market is through the spreads, bull spreads, buy the front, sell the back. Mm -hmm. Those spreads have been beaten down tremendously to levels I haven't seen in years. Okay. So from a replacement standpoint, that's something that they might consider from a risk management standpoint, and it certainly are tools to participate in the grain markets without the degree of risk that outright futures have. But that has to be done on a customer by customer basis. All right, well, appreciate the information and the, the advice here. Jim, we'll be back with more action in just a minute. For a free two-week trial to Jim's daily global market letter, call Bauer Trading toll-free at 1-800-533-8045. Ag Day, brought to you by Alevo Seed Treatment from Bayer. Protect your soybeans from SDS and nematodes this season. Day weather. Brought to you by Credenz Soybean Seed from Bayer. 
Welcome back to Ag Day, your meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, I think we've been talking about tropical storms and hurricanes <laughs> nonstop for a month now, and we still have one, almost two on the map. Yeah, we have Jose by the end of this map, as you'll see in the animations. Uh, Maria shows up uh, well east of Florida, though, it looks like. Jose just spinning its wheels, though, off the northeast coast, has been there for a couple of days. Basically, it's acting like a nor'easter. The folks in the northeast know what that is. It just brings some high surf and gusty winds, but that's not expected to hit shore. I'll show you Maria coming up here in a second. High pressure though over the southeast, really heating things up for this time of the year. We do have a front trying to come south, but it's going to stall out across the upper Midwest into the Great Lakes. There'll be some scattered showers and thunder showers along that front, but uh, most of the moisture is going to be out west with rain and mountain snows coming in. You can see that as we head through the nighttime hours tonight. And I'm going to step out of the way here because uh, we're looking at uh, high pressure over the southern Mississippi Valley, but uh, there's Maria coming in. It's going to go east of the Bahamas the way it looks. Where it goes in the long term, we still have to be concerned anywhere from the Carolinas northward, so that's something we'll be watching uh, next week. I mean, it's going to be a little while. It'll be after the weekend anyway. You can see by later in the day tomorrow, still some rain. New Mexico on northward with uh, rain and mountain snows farther north. As far as precipitation estimates over the past 24 hours, there have been a few spots get some decent amounts over the uh, northern Mississippi Valley. Adding in the next 36 hours, you'll see it's really hit and miss for most of the eastern parts of the country. And a little bit more substantial moisture out west uh, with some areas getting one to two inches of rain or melted snow the way it looks. Speaking of snow, it'll continue to uh, come down in parts of the higher elevations of the northern and central Rockies. You can see some of that even down into uh, Nevada, the Sierra Nevadas and uh, northern portions of Utah. High temperatures today east of the Rockies, though, still very hot. Lots of 80s and 90s from the southern Great Lakes all the way to the Gulf Coast. You can see lows tonight staying in the 70s from Minneapolis all the way to Brownsville and high temperatures tomorrow more of the same. Lots of 80s and 90s through the middle of the country and this is along with a lot of high humidity. So it is a uh, almost summer like weather pattern there. Much chillier almost winter like pattern in the northwestern portions of the country all because of the big trough out west, the big ridge farther east, and you can see that holds as we head through the weekend. There's the, there's Maria, by the way. We're going to have to watch that. Uh, our model showing at least getting close to the northeast coast next week. But then the trough comes into the Great Lakes. That'll bring a shot of chillier air. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to Price, Utah, first of all, increasing clouds and wind. Maybe a shower, high of 71 degrees. Ottumwa, Iowa, partly sunny, hot and humid, high of 91. And Fayetteville, North Carolina, partly sunny, chance of a shower, a thunderstorm, high of 90. Up next, news from our partners over at Drovers. Plus, we've talked a lot about lost crops from the spate of storms, but some of the farmers lost more than that. We'll hear about a family's gallant effort to save their home from the onslaught of Harvey. Ag Day, brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? Machinefinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Drover's TV on Ag Day is brought to you by QLF. For 40 years, QLF has been proud to support American farmers that feed the world. And news from our partners at Drovers, profit margins declining last week for both feed yards and beef packers, but the disparity between the two remains wide. Based on analysis from the Sterling Beef Profit Tracker, feed yard closeout showed an average profit of $25 a head, down about 10 bucks. However, beef packers earned $180 per head, a decline of about $15 per head. The Sterling Tracker says positive average feed yard margins were recorded for the 44th consecutive week. A recent study by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization says cattle raised for beef production play a key role in maintaining a sustainable food system. The research countering claims that beef production consumes too much human edible feed, showing that 86% of the feed that cattle consume are grasses grown on marginal lands not edible by humans. It says the cattle are net contributors to the global protein supply and modest yield improvements could reduce further land expansion for feed production. 
Opponents of a poultry processing plant in northeast Kansas are encouraging their supporters to remain vigilant against the proposed project by Tyson Foods. The company now rethinking the project after an activist group pushed back against the $320 million plant. Leavenworth County commissioners then voted two to one to rescind its support for the project. Tyson is considering other options after the county took away incentives. In an open letter to Leavenworth County residents, Tyson Group President for Poultry, Doug Ramsey said after the reversal of support by the Leavenworth County Commissioners, Tyson would put plans for its community on hold. He said the company would now prioritize other locations in Kansas and other states that have expressed support. Henderson says local residents who oppose Tyson's plans are concerned about the environmental impact, the smell, and the waste runoff from a facility that would process 1.3 million chickens a week. When we come back, a Texas farmer shares the story of Hurricane Harvey and the losses and what he's gained. Unlock the power of ag technology this December in Indianapolis at the first ever ag tech expo. Learn all about it at farmjournalagtech.com. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota. Check out Kubota's RTVX 1140, a rugged utility vehicle with seating for four. Stop by your local dealer today or visit Kubota.com. The images we've seen from the hurricane's impact on agriculture may not do justice to describe the devastation. In Texas, for instance, thousands of acres of cotton fields never got picked before Harvey hit. Look at these images taken by USDA photographers. This one in particular showing a tree caked with cotton fiber. You can almost swear it's snow until you remember it's summer in South Texas. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue will be in Southeast Texas later today to inspect some of the damage caused by Hurricane Harvey, just as he did for Hurricane Irma in Florida and Georgia. He'll hear stories from farm families like the Reed family of Wadsworth, Texas, who lost not only a crop, but their home. It's always, always good to make a good crop, and hey, all the all the cotton in the county was, you know, really good, exceptional. It was it was going to be a, a personal record, I know. Now it's just going to be what it is. This is kind of the. I think the depth of what it got in the house, you know, all the way up here to this log, you know, I'm sure that one's wet some too. The house was built in 79, and then they flooded twice that year. Then they built this levee around it. And that's what we were doing until, I don't remember what time it was, three or four o'clock in the morning. And I could hear the pumps quit pumping, ran out of gas, and it was raining hard still and started to walk around the, the levee to see how deep it was. And there was no sense in turning the pumps back on. You couldn't have stacked blocks in here high enough to keep the, everything dry. We started moving everything from downstairs that we could, the important stuff we thought was important at the time. 6.30 or 7, I think, is whenever we decided it was getting too deep. Got the kids out, we had to walk through the yard. My youngest had to put him on my back. Stephanie was real good. She never panicked. My nine-year-old, you know, he got scared several times. The, the five-year-old didn't. He was out of school. He was just having fun. <laughs> the barn was still, still dry. The water hadn't gotten that deep yet. We went up there and stayed for a while until it got deep up there. And then we, we kept moved on to, to higher ground. We should have left. If I'd have known that, you know, we should have left. But it's never been over the levee. So we stayed to pump the water out. This was the, the dining room. This is the, the kitchen. You know, the countertops were up here and there's water over the countertops. We've had, you know, I guess storms and hurricanes, and, but nothing's ever been like this that I can remember. But I will definitely remember 2017 and Harvey. You know, the whole family's safe and we're all good. We're, this is it's a mess, but we're gonna fix it. Just some amazing stories from Texas. Now to help out, you can go to the Texas Farm Bureau's disaster relief effort 
the Star Fund, to see how you can pitch in. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Start your day with us. For Mike Hoffman and all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Ag Day is powered by Ram Trucks, America's longest-lasting pickups.